when I share this little meme, not, I'm not a big meme professional, but you know, Tesla meme time. Uh, this looks really bad. Relax, it's already priced in. This kind of the market today with the stock falling. We hear all this goodness, and then we know that literally this is coming. This is the exponentiality, just the pricing model of the bottom line. And I get a lot of flack. It's like, oh, that's just hopium or whatever. It's impossible. This has been vetted with two experts. And I'm now going to ask you a question. Can you talk to the audience about exponentiality? And why, in your opinion, do humans have a hard time wrapping their head around it? Like you talked about bots scaling bots and then abundance. But how does that come back to stock price? Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean... Tesla is actually really a perfect case study of exponentiality. And it's funny to see how the price of the stock actually correlates to that exponential curve. Elon sets out to solve huge problems, but he takes those problems kind of one step at a time. And so if you look at the history of Tesla, really the only thing that I can tell that has a massive impact on Tesla's share price, apart from S&P inclusion, which is sort of its own little bubble, is the flow through of technology solving a problem to the point that you see the financial results and showing up as profitability for the company. And this has been a wave that they've gone through a couple of times. And so if you look back at 2012, 2013, once Tesla finally launched the Model S, it was reviewed and found to be, uh, I think it was Motor Trend Car of the Year. And then they showed their first surprise quarter of profitability and they showed, okay, this is a self-funding sustainable company with this product. The market loved that. They assigned a ton of value to it. I think it's, you know, I just like to think about it in rough orders of magnitude. It was roughly 10X move in that 2012 to 2013 time frame, the market said, okay, we don't believe this is possible. We don't think you can do this. And then the switch flips and they're like, oh, you already did it. And this is already a done deal and it's sustainable. Okay, we'll assign the value. And it gets a little bit, uh, I would say frothy, a little bit bubbly and over ambitious. And so it, it goes up really high. And then from there, you just see consolidation from 2012 all the way to 2019. And really all of that was before I became an investor in the stock. But I got in in 2017, 2018, and I honestly feel like 2022, 2023, 2024 feels in a lot of ways very similar to 2016, 2017, 2018, where we can see all of those leading indicators that I spoke about earlier, all the building blocks getting set in place to make a large move forward, but we haven't seen the financial results yet. We know that they're working on the foundation. We know that they're making continued progress and we can see that, but we, we don't see any financial results. The same thing happened as they went through the Model 3 production hell. Like we knew that they're gonna make the Model 3. It's gonna be an incredible product. Everyone's gonna want one. It's gonna be so affordable. All of that was true. But it also came with the risk that, hey, you know, maybe they actually go bankrupt in the process of trying to ramp this thing and almost happened. And so the market was right to be concerned about their ability to execute on that plan. But once they got to the other side of it and they showed profitability from that, and then it just compounded into, so we had Model 3 profitability that quickly converted into Model Y profitability, then the opening of the Shanghai plant and the opening of this whole new market that becoming profitable on a timeline that was shockingly fast. Um, all of those things kind of just in rapid succession contributed to the next 10X move in 2019 through 2021. Now in 2021, we got really frothy again. Um, you can throw in the S&P inclusion there as well. Um, and we're just doing this consolidation sideways, but all of the pieces are getting put in place in I think that it's very likely based on the way that we see artificial intelligence technology working that 
if they can get FSD working, they'll probably be able to get the bot working pretty well at roughly the same time, you know, plus or minus a couple of years. And so we could very well be in a situation where we finally see massive financial results flowing through to the bottom line from energy, FSD SaaS, even if that's short of RoboTaxi, and Optimus through whether that's just reduction in cogs in the vehicles that they're producing in the next gen vehicle platform or not. And then also, you know, the next gen vehicle platform. So we have four different things that can all contribute huge amounts of cash flow to the bottom line, to profitability. And when we begin to see those first inklings of profitability hitting the bottom line, that's when I think the next 10x move gets initiated and we're off to the races. And that's what people are very impatient about uh, you can even see it just today tesla you know you and i tell people there's nothing but good news i mean when i started investing in tesla it was during that model 3 pain period 2017 2019 total investment could have gone to zero but i believed and the point is investing is risky but you've got to mm -hmm. be in early and you got to be in hard if you want exponential gains that's the risk you take otherwise you can go buy a utility company like pacific gas and electric or whatever and mm -hmm. get your four percent per year good luck with that but i'm much more about much more dramatic results mm -hmm. now this step change we have everything coming together at the same time wall street still doesn't see even dan ives today a month ago he was all it's an ai robotics company it's going to be the new apple with services today it's like I mean, it's a car company, margins, we want more. Like he just flipped his tune like that. And these, these guys, like I mentioned with their little pencils and their guidance, if they don't get it, they get so upset and they throw their toys out the window and move on. But now, because Tesla is so retail oriented, now they're all pissed off as well, like the analysts. And I don't know where to go from here. Like that, the stuff I got from that meeting was interesting. And I've got another slide where there's so much to talk about here. This is from uh, the Cobasi. I think they said it very eloquently, far more eloquent than I ever could say. I'd like your thoughts on this. And they wrote this this morning. The beauty of Tesla is that it's never been a conventional company. Tesla does not operate like a traditional company with quarterly results tailored to what Wall Street wants. Rather, it's a story about innovation and vision from Elon Musk. And Wall Street's definition of a perfect company, it does not fit that bill. And Elon does not placate Wall Street at all. In addition, it's not just a car company. It's a robotics company. We figured that out during this video today. And betting against Tesla has never worked in the long run. So what, what are your take on this from Kobesi? I thought it was beautifully written. Yeah, I love how concise that is. And I think that that rule of thumb is good. Like never bet against Tesla in the long run. Like you can win in the short run. And sometimes, you know, if your time horizon, like if I needed my money over the next year, I wouldn't be putting it in Tesla, honestly, because I have no idea what we're going to be in for this coming year. And it could be bad. And I wouldn't want to take a 50% haircut on something, but I don't need that money in the next year. That's not what I'm investing for. I'm investing for the long term. And so that's one of the reasons why Tesla has attracted such a large retail base is because a lot of retail investors do have much longer time horizons. And that's uh, an advantage that anyone out there who is a retail investor has is that you can think about companies and technology over a time horizon that no one on Wall Street is allowed to have. And you can use that as an arbitrage opportunity to invest in things that they're not going to invest in now that absolutely will perform if you can just be patient. And so you can be paid for two things. Well, really three things. Discretion, you have to find the right thing. Combined with patience, combined with the ability to stomach volatility. If you can combine those three things, you have an incredible opportunity to make massive gains over the long term. And of course, that's not financial advice. Yeah, and there's so much analogy as well with crypto, what I also do. 
You get in early, get in hard, and the volatility will make you sick. But if you are patient, you win. So let's, let's look at a couple more quick slides, and then we'll go through a quick fire round. And I know, I hope you're okay for time. One of these is this. Uh, I'd like you to talk to us real quick about S-curves. Norway, I see, is the canary in the mine. They are now 82% market share last week for BEVs. And the rest of the world will follow this pattern, but few people, just like exponentiality, they don't understand S-curves and how BEV adoption is coming. Fit, fast, and furious. What's your take on this? So S-curves are essentially exponentials. Like this is the practical way that exponentials play out as far as technologies transitioning from one technology to another technology. And that there's a you know three phases of the S curve. There's the initial phase where the technology just is not that competitive and it's not that compelling. And the only people that are excited about it are the early adopter types. And then they, through iterations and refinement and meeting those customers' needs and making the product better, are able to really refine it and get the cost down to where then the value proposition starts to become very clear that this is going to be superior to the existing technology. And that's where the S-curve bends up and goes into this near vertical section of just incredible adoption. Um, during and I would say that we're really at that point now with EVs that um, you know obviously Norway is a lot further down this road. You know, in the U.S., we're at what I think between fifteen and twenty percent adoption, so almost down there at the bottom of this ginormous curve here. You know, that's going to to transition very soon, um, and that's where you you start going vertical with this adoption, and this is something that is inevitable globally over the next 10, 20 years. Um, it's just a matter of getting all the supply chains built up and continuing to ship more products so that those prices can come down further and further.